I am bringing the Night Pants Nation toward a Minneapolis, April 28th through the 30th, June 4th, Los Angeles at the world famous Troubadour. June 24th, Des Moines, Iowa, one night only, and June 25th, Omaha, Nebraska, one night only. Get your tickets now at ryansickler.com. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all your social media. I want to say thank you, as I do every week, for all your support. This podcast continues to grow and grow. For the last four months, our audio downloads alone have been over a million. So thank you. The YouTube numbers are climbing. Please subscribe. It's a free thing to do to help the show out, and it really does help the show out. So uh, if you got to have more Honeydew, Man, check out the Patreon. It's called The Honeydew With Y'all. It's five bucks a month. If you're in for a year, you're getting over a month free, and you're getting the Honeydew a day early ad free at no additional cost, all right? We've got some of the wildest stories, I promise you, in comedy that you've ever fucking heard. For five bucks, it'll blow your goddamn mind, all right? Uh, Come out, see me on tour. All tickets to all shows are available at ryansickler.com, all right? Now, you guys know what we do over here. We highlight the lowlights. I always say these are the stories behind storytellers. I'm very excited to have today's guest back on The Honeydew, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Greg Fitzsimmons. Welcome back to The Honeydew, Greg. Ryan. To be asked back is always really the pressure because the first time in, you got that excitement. You're a newbie. It's like being a it's like being a virgin. Yeah, you know, being a virgin that first time, you know, it's really special. But the second time, time. Farner Double Vision Mm -hmm. album probably gonna get demonetized right out of the gate. Oh (laughs) shit! They they demonetize a lot of mine anyway. Yeah, mine do too. I get (laughs) fucked. I get fucked. I had this thing where I do a podcast called The Sunday Papers and we do our fans, we've been doing it for two years, every single week, our one of our fans writes and produces and records a theme song for us that's different. Oh, hell yeah. And we do it every week and then some guy took the songs he did for us and he copyrighted them. And so every one of those episodes, he got paid for. No. Because that's what that's what YouTube does. If you use somebody yeah. else's music, all the revenue that you made from your YouTube clicks goes to them. So we stopped doing the songs. Mother. I know. Well, I'll tell you what, before we get into what we're going to talk about today, plug, promote, everything oh, yeah, and anything you'd like. Ready? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Thank you for coming back, dude. Um, Fitz Dog Radio is my other podcast, and then Sunday Papers comes out on Sunday, and then Childish comes out on Wednesday, and then I got tour dates coming up, La Jolla, um, Comedy Store La Jolla, Spokane Comedy Club in April, then we got New Orleans and Lafayette, Louisiana, then we got Plainville, Massachusetts at some casino, Denver Comedy Works at the end of April, and then we got... Uh, Irvine, Tacoma. Damn. Yeah, it's a, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, Bakersfield. It's all at fitzdog.com. F i t z d o g dot com. Um, I would. I was just saying out loud. So I'm gonna try to make this happen. I would love to perform in New Orleans. Where do you perform when you're there? It's my first time. It's this place called the Howlin' Wolf. I okay. think it's a. I think it's a rock club that they're doing comedy yeah. at. Yeah. So I'm doing. I'm flying in. <clears throat> going in a day early because I haven't spent much time in New Orleans. That's such a great city. And I'm going to do that. And then um, I think a bunch of my friends are going to fly down with me. And then we're, and then we're going to drive to Lafayette, Louisiana, which is like in the middle of, Yeah. you know. Have you been there? No. Yeah. I just know it's in the middle of fucking nowhere. Middle I've driven of nowhere. Because I've driven from Maryland to uh, New Orleans and back. So I've been oh, all you through did? the bumfuck. Yeah. Wow. All through Mississippi, all yeah. through Louisiana. Yeah. Let me know how it is. I really want to go. I have right. no idea how I would sell there or anything, but yeah. I just want to get down to New Orleans and tell some jokes. Oh, down hell there. yeah. There's no comedy clubs in New Orleans. Yeah, there's not a comedy club. There yet. never has been. I mean, is for, that right? for like a minute here and there, comedy clubs have popped up, but there's never been a substantial run of a comedy club in New Orleans. So weird. I mean, it's kind of like Chicago was like that for a long time. There was no good stand up, and now, now you know, Zanies right? was Zanies was always there, but like, but it was a an small improv club. city then, more than stand up. Yeah, it Isn't was that all wild? improv Isn't and that sketch. Crazy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
there's a few cities that are big that never had a big stand-up presence. Um, but what do you think of L.A. versus New York comedy? Well, as far as stand-ups, I think New York owns L.A., but as far as podcasting, I think L.A. owns New York. There you go. Yeah, I'll go with that. I would say that's fair. Yeah. I mean, the opportunity to get on stage in New York is there's so many more chances. And, you know, if you really utilize it, then you can see why those guys are strong and good and funny. And it makes you funnier because right. when you're watching Attell and Sam Morell and Colin Quinn and, you know, and then the big names that come down, it's just not even the big names. It's the guys that are grinding it out. Joe List and Mark Norman. Shane Gillis, all those yeah, guys. Shane, Mark Norman, Krista Stefano. Shane fucking kills. Big J, Dan yep. Soder, those yep. guys. Yeah, so you better yep. step up your fucking game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's that run of L.A. comics out here, I would say, that, that are – getting up as much as they are. What do we have out here? Unless you're on a fucking mic circuit. You got Supernova. Yeah. You got Laugh Factory. Mm. Even the Ice House is still closed. Yeah. You got the Improv and you got the Comedy Store. Yeah. And even they're not seven nights right. a week. Right, right. We're still behind the whole... You know, you travel. This yeah. This place is like a fucking... God damn, time warp back here. Well, what I do, because I'm usually gone on the weekends on the road, so I usually do spots in town like on Wednesday, Thursday night. So that way, since I'm only doing a couple nights a week mm -hmm. and I live in Venice, I'll try to go out and do three spots. I'll try to do all the clubs in one night. And West Side Comedy is a great. I want to give, I wanna give them great. love. They're yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Chris Gorbos and those yeah, guys are great, great club. club. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so let's let's get into some of your uh, right. trauma because I want to hear about the, Jesus. Um, I mean, what a show! I know what I a love show, it. and I love Come the on. laundry list. <laughs> Come on and tell us the worst parts of your life. Yeah, I'm watching everybody's Instagram, Jesus. and I'm tired of seeing your best pictures. Yeah. Um, tell me about the the BU softball worlds. Oh, you know what? I'm an idiot. Okay. I am a fucking moron. It's softball. I've been I've, the whole time. Was baseball. Yes, oh, the whole no. time. I was like. Huh? No, not only was it softball, but at BU, because it was a city school, we, we the didn't Eagles? Have... The Eagles? Boston? No, that's Boston College. Oh, we're Boston we're College. the Terriers. The Terriers. But it was okay. a D1 school, but the softball fields were so small that we played with a 14-ounce ball. It was fucking huge because the fences weren't as far out. Nah, is so that right? So it would have been a home run derby if they used regular-sized softballs. So anyway, so I grew up. Not a great athlete. I love sports. I would play any sport. I had a brother who was 13 months older than me, so Irish twins competing, yeah. playing. and uh, But I was just never, I, I, whatever, I lacked the confidence to be a really great athlete. And I was fucking tiny. I was skinny as hell. I looked like I just, uh, I looked like Karen Carpenter growing up. <laughs> And uh, and and I was just as emotional, and I was just as emotional as Karen Carpenter. <laughs> you can see it from the outside. <laughs> I wore flared denim and paisley shirts, oh, and, and so shit. so I um, my father coached me in baseball, and he was my father was a six foot three guy from the Bronx, and he was a fucking tough guy, and he coached like a tough guy. Was he harder on you because you were his son? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, he used to bench me. He used to <laughs> put me. Benched. Oh my god! And then I lost my I lost my mitt, and so he made me play with the catcher's mitt. We had an extra catcher's mitt. And I was playing third base with a fucking catcher's mitt, <laughs> and uh, but like he just he, he was like a he, he had a cigarette dangling out of his yeah, mouth, and he had a few drinks you in could him. Never coach like that no. today. Our coach had a cigarette hanging in his mouth while he leaned over your shoulder and showed you how to bat and shit. It would be burning <laughs> right, right, your eyes like, right, God right. damn. Then coach. you're like, do you have an erection? <laughs> this is a weird coaching stance. <laughs> Behind every kid. <laughs> yep, they're talking like, 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 smoking yeah. like, oh, man, shit. But that's why Bad News Bears was so great. The Walter best. Matthau was the... With the with the cooler full of beers at every practice. The movie it's it's a hundred percent perfect. I tell Segor about this all the time. Like we in life, the comedians, we're the bad news bears. We're not supposed to win. Yeah. We're not supposed to win. It's supposed to be right there. Right. And it's, it ain't happening. Right. That's right. who we are. We're right. the bad news fucking bears. Yeah. But don't worry, we're coming back next year. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's a great movie. It's a great movie. And uh and Jesus Christ, the language that those kids were using. Yeah. You can it's never crazy. do anything like that. The now. trailer of the movie used the N-word. The trailer did? The trailer I didn't remember when it that. first came out. 
I remember all the language in it and the, the beer drinking and Tatum the O'Neill smoking. goes, all, all we got on this team, all we got on this, this team. Yeah. Tatum yeah. was a bunch of, and then she lists every bad racial yeah. epithet you could say. Yeah. Which I don't say. Yeah. Go um, watch the original. Yeah. So uh, so he coached me and I was, uh, I was nervous. I was a nervous player. And that's no way to play baseball. The worst thing about baseball is you're just hanging out. You're on a field. You're relaxed. There's butterflies. It's spring. Your, your mind wanders. And then in a millisecond, you have to be a superb athlete. You have to snap <laughs> yeah. into action. <laughs> Shit's coming right yeah, fucking at you. Right. Yeah, right. And then yeah. turn around and throw, throw it. It's just like, I hated baseball. I was so glad my son didn't want to play baseball uh, and took up ballet instead. He gets a lot of pussy. No, <laughs> I didn't take a ballet. I should have. He would thank me when he was older if I pushed him into ballet. Damn yeah, right he would. He'd be like, thank Hold you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, cut to college. And now I love intramural sports in college because it's all the kids that couldn't make real teams. So the the bar has been lowered on him. Yeah, actually yeah, yeah. not as bad as I was before. And so- I'm on this team and all my friends in college, I don't know why, but like this was my my senior year. I had four roommates. One was the uh, captain of the lacrosse team. One was captain of the tennis team. One was captain of the rugby team. And then the other guy was also on lacrosse. And then me. The, and I was doing stand-up comedy at this point, which is why I think they liked me and I, I got to be with the cool kids. So we had an intramural softball team and they were fucking good. And so they put me at catcher because in softball, the catcher does almost nothing. Okay, so let me ask you this. This bigger ball, do you have a different glove or is it still fit into a regular glove? Same glove. It is, yeah. okay. Is Except, it harder though? Like the web and that, it's a bigger ball, you said? Yeah, you need a decent size because okay. you know there's infielder gloves yeah, and outfielder, outfielder gloves. Glove, yeah. So you you need a uh, outfielder glove. Those okay. are the bigger ones. Yeah. And so, uh, my, but my glove, because I didn't have one, is I brought my father's baseball mitt to college and it was kind of like sentimental it made me think about my dad and it was it was it was big but it was fucking old it was like an old dried out mitt and so but i'm playing catcher so it doesn't really matter and uh, <laughs> so we make it through the playoffs there's 113 teams in the league damn it's big oh, there's 30,000 kids yeah. that's a lot i didn't 113 think 113 teams that's a lot we make it to the World Series. We're Damn. in the finals. How many games? Do you remember how you had to play to get lot. through that? It was like it was like, it's it's like be, right? two, it was like two games a week for you know the whole the whole yeah. What is it? A fall game or spring? A spring game. Spring. Yeah. So we make it to the World Series and uh, and we're playing great. You know, John Matarazzo, who's 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 on varsity hockey, uh, is is a righty, but he can hit opposite field, but he doesn't show it. He doesn't show it. He he hits him down the left side until until he gets some guys on base, and then he goes opposite field. So they he hits him hard left. They shift the outfield. He goes boom. right down the right yeah. field line. I mean, these guys are amazing. And so then, uh, what's your I, team name? Do you remember? I don't remember. No. And then uh, and I so so anyway, we're we are um, we are tied. Bottom of the ninth. They're up. They got a man on second, guy gets up, line drives to center field. Guy from second rounds third. Bill Mountford's in center field, gets the ball, throws a fucking rope. <laughs> rope. I'm, I'm hoping it bounces before it gets to me, but no, it's coming hot, <laughs> straight <Sizzling>. in. <laughs> and I'm, I got my feet planted. I'm in front of the plate. I'm ready to take the hit. And the ball comes in. And, uh, and I got him. This guy's about two-thirds of the way towards me, and the ball is right there. I got him. We're, we're going overtime. Third, two outs. Ball comes in, hits my father's dried-out old mitt, and the seam pops. No. And the fingers open. No. And the ball goes right through. Ah. And the guy scores, and they win the World Series. <laughs> that's how they and, won. Yeah, that's how they won. And these guys had no mercy. It wasn't like it wasn't like, hey, Fitzy, you fucked up. It was like, hey, Fitzy, you fucked up. They were mad. These are real athletes. Yeah, yeah. And so, I so I was buying. I had to buy beers all night for everybody. And I just stood Dude. there, and I literally did have tears in my eyes because that it brought back so many fucking memories of. 
not being good enough for my father, and here it is, his, his mitt. Glove. Oh man, that is brutal. Uh, That's brutal. Yeah, I, I had so much insecurity about sports too, because I really, when you're a when you're a boy, so much of how you define yourself is. I guess it depends on the boy, but for me, it was so much about sports because yeah. my dad was kind of athletic, and you know, uh, I just. Uh, yeah, my daughter's point. in softball now, and she's like, I hate batting. I go, I know. You feel like everyone's watching yeah. you. And she's like, yeah. And I go, look, also, I don't know what the fuck league we got her ass in, but it's – they're the kids are pitching. Yeah. All right? And it, they're way too young to be pitching. We used to pitch – How old are they? They're seven. Yeah. We used to pitch in our little league. Kids are throwing it over the backstop. Yeah, it's yeah, taking yeah, forever. Right. So they do this thing where it's four pitches, and then the coach comes out. Perfect. So um, I told her, I go, don't swing. Do not swing. There's none of these kids are throwing strikes. Just stand there. I go, if one's Play close, listen for your hit kid. But, lesson. Don't play. But no, no, no. I teach her to have a good eye. I yeah. go, if that thing's near, you hit it. But if not, if that thing's over your head or in the dirt, like she didn't even know. I go, you don't. She thought I had to swing no matter what and try to hit that right. thing no matter. I'm like, no, 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 no. You got to try to hit it if it's right in this strike zone. Yeah. And if it's not, then wait for the coach to come out. And she has not got a hit yet. She keeps fouling them hard left. I'm like, oh, you're early. She uh, keeps get, oh, she's so close. Yeah. Uh, but I get it. She's like, oh, I don't, I don't like that feeling. I know it's all I remember feeling like that. My dad would yell too and be like, Did he ever coach you? Yeah, he would coach and help out and shit to him. He was always harder on us too. Mm -hmm. And but he would tell us that later. He's like, I'm harder on you because you're my kid and because I also have seen you do better. I yeah. know you can do better. Like some of those kids can't do better. Yeah. I my dad gave up on me. He like, and then I played hockey. Like and, his glove did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like his condom did, because I was an accidental bird. Wait, really? <laughs> <laughs> Just full of quit. Just full of quit. <laughs> but that he gave hilarious. up on me. Like I played high school uh, ice hockey. and You did? I did, but. Here's how bad I was. I was good enough to make the team every year. I was on JV freshman year, JV sophomore year, JV junior year, and then and then I think this is against the rules. I was on JV as a senior. Were you really? I was the captain of the JV team when I was a senior. But I was funny. That's why they kept me on. That's yeah, why yeah. the coach liked me because like I used to give like we had these morning meetings two days a week in front of the whole school in the auditorium, and I would get up and I would do. Uh, remember when Joe Piscopo used to do the sports report on SNL on Weekend yep. Update? I used to do it like that. And I would do these really funny reviews of the games. And uh, and so I cracked everybody up. And then, you know, and then I would, before before games, we would all drink. We had, uh, if we had Friday games, we would get out of school and then we'd go drink and then we'd play. It was fun. We yeah. just fucked around. Never came to, my dad never came to a game. Never came? Oh, no, no. He came to one game. Which one? It was the one where uh, I went to check a kid because the kid was up against the glass and my dad was standing right there. And I'm like, I'm going to line this motherfucker up. My dad's going to see the pain. He's going to see blood splatter on that glass and he's going to accept me for the athlete that I am. So I go charging at the kid and then he digs me out and I go flying into the glass. <laughs> Right your dad's face. <laughs> and he can see the look in my eyes. Sorry, dad. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's fucking great. That is just brutal. Oh, my God. Oh, the shame. And, and then my kid turns out to be a fucking star uh, athlete. Really? What sports? Soccer. He started soccer. Yeah. Well, first he, he did Taekwondo as a kid, mm -hmm. and he got his black belt when he was about 13 years old. And then he started playing soccer when he was probably about maybe nine. And this kid played club soccer and school soccer. So he was playing soccer six days a week for 10 years and uh, through all through high school. He was the captain of his club team. His senior year, he was captain of his high school team and his club team. Damn. Both teams went undefeated. Wow, undefeated. And, and he was a star. And he could have played D1 soccer. But he was. He thought about it. He had people looking at him, and he was like, "Nah, I want to have a life in college." And I was like, "Well, I don't know where you got it. I don't know where you got the talent from." That's badass. Yeah. What position? 
midfielder. Man, see those guys were. Yeah, I played soccer my whole life too. I was. Defense. Did you really? I, yeah, I was. I was good. I, I was all JUCO. That's why I always joke about all JUCO. I was all JUCO in community college. What's JUCO? Junior college. That's all. Yeah. You know. Uh, you see it mostly with football, but these JUCO guys are the guys that like went to a D1 school. They got in some kind of fucking trouble. Yeah. They go to a junior college to rebuild their character and themselves right, right. and their stats. And then they go back to a different D1 school right. and then into the NFL usually. Yeah. But um, I was all JUCO in college. And then I played um, for the U.S. when I was 16. I My brother and I both went out for this. Um, it was like a U.S. development team. Um, and we made that, and I went and played soccer in Europe for. So most most kids, they backpack and do all that bullshit. Yeah. I still got my month in Europe, but I went playing soccer. Nice. Uh, we, yeah, we made a team. It was it was an under seventeen um, teams USA like Olympic development squad or uh -huh. some bullshit. I mean, I knew we weren't going anywhere after that. Yeah, but that's that was amazing. A lot of fun. It was fun. You must have a good hard ass. Bro, let me tell you something. We went. I had a good tight ass. You did. We went over there. And we we fucking we were so cocky and arrogant, just uh -huh. such sixteen year old dicks. Yeah. And we go right down the field. I'll never forget. And we scored like that. And we thought we were like, "Whoa, oh, we are gonna fucking we're gonna run this fucking country." Yeah. Greg Fitzsimmons, we didn't win a game. <laughs> We didn't win. We were there yeah. for a month. Listen to me. We played two, three times a day. We yeah. didn't win a fucking yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. We got our asses It's kicked. a different sport over there. What I loved about it was the physicality, though. That's the way I wanted to play here. They allow you to play rougher over there. Yeah. But, man, are they so much more advanced. This A friend of mine, Sam, he said he was talking to an English buddy of his, and he said the reason that he – he coaches soccer, and the reason he thinks a lot of Americans suck at soccer is because we force our kids right into competition. It's a, like my daughter; she shouldn't be playing softball right, right now. She should be learning skills. So he said that's what they do over there. It's it's a couple of years of skills and rules and things, and then they intermix games and fun shit in there. They don't go into competition and recording stats and who wins and loses until later. No kidding. And that's what he believes separates the rest of the world from us is that we're. Get in there and what, my daughter, the guy's like, the play's at second. I go, do you know what that means? She goes, no, I don't know what the play's at second means. I go, why would you? It's a foreign language right, to you. Right, right. You know, Dude, like, King Richard. You see that movie, King I Richard? I haven't watched it yet. It's all about he keeps the daughters out of the yeah. juniors. You know, every other, no pro tennis player had ever made it before without having gone through the junior system. Is that right? And he said, fuck that. I want them to have a childhood. I want them to study. I want them to learn three languages. And they're not going to – and so he uh, he had a, the the best coach in the country took the Williams girls when they were about 13 to Florida in a training camp. And then they got there, and he was like, okay, we got we got tournaments coming up. And the father was like, they're not going to play any matches until they're 16 or something, 17. So for three years, just skills, just skills. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. Um. Wow, so you were good, and and did you That's, did you, did was, you meet any girls in Europe, or it was just all yeah, you met did. a couple girls. Really? I am back. Listen, this is eighty nine. So man, my father was pissed when I was calling this girl from Holland. Man. Yeah, he was like, "What the hell? Yeah, That's yeah, a forty dollar yeah. phone right, bill." Right. <laughs> <laughs> then you show a picture of her, and he's like, "All right, get on get on the yeah." She was a cute little blonde, and then I met um, a girl from New Jersey named Vanessa, and we kept in touch for a while. She and her friend would come down. They were Jersey, we were Maryland, so it wasn't that far. Yeah. We'd all hang out. But, um, man, it was a fucking uh, – we went to Holland, Germany, England. We didn't go to London. We went to England, um, Belgium, Scotland, and there was one more country we went to. Did I say Denmark? Damn. Oh, I don't know. We went you went to over. Denmark? Yeah, we went over there. Yeah. And a kid on the team stole the fucking country's flag. No shit. We were like, are you fucking nuts? Whoa. We're like, imagine right now if we were in the U.S. and somebody fucking – Stole an American flag off a store. Yeah, I was like, it. He he folded it up and set it over That's somewhere. Ballsy. We ran away. I was like, fuck you. I had never shoplifted in my life. Yeah. I still have never shoplifted in my life except the last week in Europe when we were all out of money. Uh -huh. We were fucking dying and ditching everywhere, yeah. just hauling oh, ass, really? hauling right through yeah. the games. We yeah. would run right in through the middle of the fucking <laughs> games to get away. It was bad. It got bad. It got bad. Yeah, we shoplifted like maniacs when I was a kid. That's all we did. Um, Is your dad still alive? No, he died when he was 52. 52? That's young. Yeah, what yeah, happened? he was young. Heart attack. 
at Rayo's in Harlem, you know, that that restaurant? And I love their sauce. Yeah, their sauce is great. Yeah. So uh, it's a mob joint. And uh, I think we talked about, last time I was on the podcast, we talked Did about we? my dad dying. But yeah, so it's weird because now I'm 55 and I've gone past. I am older now than my father ever was. That blow your mind? It blows my mind. I, I say those exact words. My dad died when he was 42. I'm 49 now. And it yeah. blows my mind every day that yeah. I get up. And also, I'm think I still think like, man, I feel young, but 42 was seven years ago. I felt even younger then. Like, yeah, man, that's an right. early fucking time yeah. to go. You probably look better now than your dad did at 42, right? Yeah, guys aged more fast back then. Yeah, he definitely looked older. I feel like than 42. Yeah. Um, How did he, he die? But he had, I had gray hair. He didn't. He had yeah. brown hair. Well, it's interesting. So originally, it was ruled a heart attack, but yeah. then. Right when I turned 42, this is fucking so crazy. Right when I turned 42, I start having these crazy, like, uh, health problems. I had just um, had kidney stones. Oof. And both of my legs clotted. <sighs> so I think it's the kidney stones or whatever, and they can't figure it out for, like, six months. I'm going through all these tests and everything. And um, at the end of it, they find out I have this blood disease uh, called Factor V light and where I'm prone to clotting, Okay. So they're like, you need to get um, genetic testing. You done. could die from blood clots. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I was. It was bad. Like yeah. it was. They could not figure it out, and they would keep flushing me and shit. So I, um, they're like, you have to get genetic testing done because if one parent has it, it's not as bad as if both parents have mm -hmm. it. So the thing is, I'm never gonna know if my dad had it if my mom has it. Okay. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, I, I don't know how bad I'm gonna have it. So I got to call my brothers and everybody. They all go get tested. None of them have it. My mom, my two brothers. So my dad had it. And all these years later, the doctors tell me now, like, they also said anytime in the 80s, uh, someone died young, they just called it a heart, heart attack. attack and, yeah. and now, you know, 30 years fucking of technology and everything, they're realizing that a lot of these people actually died of, um, why can't I think of it now? Fucking clots. Yeah. And he did have a little blood on his lip, and there was a little on his toe. So they don't know if he bit his lip when he died or right. tongue or if he actually had a clot. So uh. I ended up having a clot. I fucking get through it, thank God. And I find out I have this. So now I just – it's not it's nothing you could – like diet doesn't really help it or anything. It's a genetic thing. And um, I got to wear compression pants on planes and shit. And I got to get up every – like I can feel my legs if I sit longer than 90 minutes. When I, I don't get up, know, I feel it. And I hate to be like a, a backseat doctor, but like, have you tried um, gay conversion therapy? <laughs> gay conversion yeah, therapy? I mean, what the I fuck just, are you talking just about? This might be good for you. I don't know. <laughs> for my fucking blood clots. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, you know, when they, when they came up with, you know, boner pills, they were originally meant for something else. And it turned out it helped with that. So just give it a shot. I read it was for, um, what was it? So I think it was like... Uh, uh, heart cholesterol or something? heart blood pressure yeah, or some yeah, yeah. shit. Right. And I think women had it too. And they gave, they, they, some study I read where like the women gave it back and the guys did not. And they were like, what's going on there? <laughs> I guess I'm make my fucking dick hard. That's what's going Dude, on. Dude, I do a, I do an ad for Blue Chew, which is the boner pills. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my friend's gay and he goes, uh, he listens to the podcast. He goes, hey, do they, keep, they give you free samples for the, for the, um, Blue Chew? And I was like, yeah, they send me like cases of yeah, like, so do. much of it. He goes, can I get some? I go, wait, let me get it. So you're gay and you need boner pills? I go, you ever think maybe you're not gay? Maybe you just like nice haircuts and show tunes? Like if it's if it's not getting hard, maybe you're not gay. He's like, I'm fucking gay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you how gay I, I am. I'm just He's drunk most it. of the time. <laughs> He sends me these videos. He goes out on Sunday nights because Sunday nights is, is like the real gay party night. And he'll send me these videos of like these bars and he walks in and like middle-aged guys with like bellies are hanging from leather harnesses face down and guys just come by and like slap their asses and stick stuff in their mouth. And, <laughs> and he, you're not supposed to be filming that shit, but oh, he's yeah. always like, oh, yeah. he's always like discreetly shooting like the darkest shit that happens. Man, I went to a, a club, Hollywood's a wild place. When I first moved here, I dated this girl from Argentina. I mean, this chick was... 
just you know they say whatever she was definitely out of my league yeah. like i was like this this girl is doesn't know she has no idea and i mean just a bombshell yeah. and she was fucking she spoke spanish you know just everybody at work was like there's no way she likes you i was like yeah. i'm with you yeah. i'm with you All right. So one night she's like, you want to take ecstasy? I'd never taken ecstasy. And she's like, and we're going to rent a limo and we're going to go out. And I was like, okay. So we take ecstasy and she takes me to this place on Santa Monica Boulevard. It was one of those, um, it was a club depending on the night. It was a building basically. And Monday night it was this and Tuesday night. But Saturday night it was a place called Cinematic, S-I-N-Matic. And in the front of the club was just clubby dance, whatever. And she's holding my hand and we're just fucking zooming. And she's just walking me through this club full of just Hollywood freaks, dancing, leather, fishnet, all this shit. We go to the back where there's a door. We go in, shut the, the door, door. And it's a fucking maybe 20-person live S&M show. Nice. And I was just like, and I was, and she's like, do you like what you see? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And that was the night before Father's Day, and I I would like to look at the camera now and apologize to her dad for all <laughs> the shit I did to his daughter the night before Father's Day. <laughs> I tell you, she didn't sleep. I promise you that she did not sleep. <laughs> well, so it was interactive. Yeah, you you could. You didn't have to. But you did. I did not go up with no. She and I went home after that. Oh, oh, you got inspired by it, and then you went home and you yeah, spanked her a little yeah. bit. But it yeah. was interactive. If you wanted Damn. to come up and respectfully do, like, there was a girl up there with her nipples clamped, and you could go up and put shit on people's bodies, or, you know, uh, they would have um, shit, like, suspended from their, like, yeah, little weights yeah. and shit suspended from yeah. their nipples, and they're fucking whipping each other. You could yeah. go up and whip somebody. Yeah, and she all she wore that night was a fishnet outfit with pasties over her titties and a g-string. Really? That was her outfit. Yeah, I was like, "Where are we going?" And what were you wearing? Fucking jeans, <laughs> jeans and like a t-shirt t or something, a hoodie. What I always wear. <laughs> Same shit. <laughs> and everybody just looking. It's funny because when you're with a, a woman like that or a guy like that, and they're so good looking, you know everyone's gonna look. Yeah, you know. But she, it wasn't just her getting the looks. I was the secondary looks. I was getting like what. You? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, you? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, tonight it is. Yeah, God. and all they're thinking is this guy's packing. <laughs> He's got something going on we don't know about. I did. I had something going on. Yeah. When you push your body too hard or you just feel run down, it's extremely important to stay hydrated. Making hydration a priority helps us feel better on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, liquid IV it's the best, guys. I, I take it every day. I'm, even if I'm feeling run down, I throw a liquid IV in some water and boom, off you go. It's just a simple little pouch. You shake it up, boom, drop it in. I promise you you're good to go. Hydration's everything, all right? And one stick of liquid IV hydration multiplier and 16 ounces of water, it hydrates faster and more efficiently than water alone. It contains five essential vitamins. It's got B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks, and it's made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. All right? Grab Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code HONEYDO at checkout. That's 25% off of anything you order there, okay? When you use the promo code HONEYDO at liquidiv.com, experience better hydration today at liquidiv.com, promo code HONEYDO. Saying goodbye to high interest credit card debt is one of the first steps towards financial independence, but the interest month after month can feel like you're in a never ending hamster wheel. And that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart powered personal loans can help you pay down high interest debt all online with simple and easy to understand payment terms. Upstart has helped over 1.8 million customers on their path to financial freedom and a ton of you off of this show. All right. So whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, Upstart can help you get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score, so rather than looking at your credit score alone, Upstart's model considers other factors like your income, your employment, and other information provided in your loan application to find you a smarter rate for your loan. And you can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000 without impacting your credit score. You can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait. 
and check your rate today at upstart.com slash honeydew. That's upstart.com slash honeydew to check your rate today. And don't forget to use my URL to let them know I sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash honeydew. Now, let's get back to the do. I want to hear about this assault. All right, back to BU. Uh, I went to uh, I went to college, and um, after I didn't apply to BU. I I was in Europe. I took a year off after high school. I worked two jobs for like six months, and then I went to Europe for six months with a backpack on. I saved three thousand dollars, and was it lasted me six months. It did. Well, it was like 1985. You know, there was, but you actually were good about it. You didn't blow it. Well, I bought a one. I bought a one month URL pass, and then some French guy showed me how to forge it to change it to a six month URL <laughs> okay, pass. <all> right. <laughs> so buses and buses and trains were free. Yeah, I was staying in youth hostels where it was usually like ten dollars a night. And then once you're at the youth hostel, people tell you, you know, you got the Swiss guy that goes, hey, man, you can get falafels at this place down on L Street. They're, they're two bucks. And, you know, and then people share food. And it's just like you're, you're living cheap, which is the best way to travel. Yeah. Because you get to know people and you count on people and you kind of like, you know, and just hooking up, like having sex with, I mean, it just girls, like you said, you're way up out the of my league. And stuff. Hooked up at the hostels all the time. I went to the one in Barcelona. I walk in and I open the the door for the uh for the showers and I walk in and I see three naked chicks and I I close the door I walk out and then as I'm walking away this girl opens the door and she goes uh no 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 it is uh how you say co-educational and I'm like no it's not <laughs> and I'm walking and there's like you know fucking danish girls and like African girls and everybody's everybody's just embracing it and everybody's naked and and it wasn't like stalls it was like a it was like a Holocaust shower it was a wide <laughs> open room with just spigots <laughs> and people <laughs> fucking drying their asses and oh my god I just want you to know you just ruined that <laughs> motherfucking fantasy for me I saw the steam part ways and I saw the corners of women uh, over here, here. There's, nothing that. That. Yeah. there's nothing sexy about that yeah there's nothing sexy about that. That's the least sexy shower scene in history. <laughs> that in Psycho. That in yeah, Psycho, right, yeah. right? And so, oh, and I, I, I took a lot of shower. I was there for three days. I took like three showers a day, man. I was shriveled up. I, was, I would be too. Yeah. Holy shit. I remember when we were in um, Belgium, we were waiting um, to get a ferry to go back to, I think it was. It's Ferry. Ferry. What I know I you're from Baltimore. You ferry. said ferry. Yeah, how do you say it? It's ferry. F E R R Y. Say Ferris wheel. Ferris wheel. <laughs> what do you say, Ferris wheel? Yeah, Ferris wheel. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call this part of your face? A forehead. What do you say? Forehead. I say you it do wrong. Say far? I don't know why I say okay. forehead, but I also me and Kreischer for some reason both say uh, what's the word we both say wrong? Um, maybe it's forehead. This is definitely forehead. That's on the list. Yeah. Fairy. Anyway. I used to say Sigourney Weaver. Did you really? Yeah, until somebody's like, it's Sigourney. Jesus. I was like, but wait, you don't say Journey. You say Journey. Yeah. Oh, Nightmare. Me and no, Bird say he Nightmare. Did, he said that yeah. on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. a nightmare. I don't know why I say it that way. <laughs> so anyway, so I save up all this money. Yes. I go to Europe. I come back. And while I was gone, and I had no plans of going to college. I was a D student in high school. And uh, so my father took it upon himself to apply to Boston University. And uh, and I get home and he goes, congratulations. I said, what? He goes, you got into BU. I go, I didn't apply to BU. He goes, congratulations. And so I realized he wrote the essay. He did it? He wrote the essay about my trip to Europe based on the postcards I was sending him from the road. And so I get in and I show up to college and I'd never been in the city before. I literally showed up. My, my, my mom brought me up my first day of school and like not a day early, like the, the, the no, the night before class was starting, I show up. 250,000 kids show up to Boston for college every fall. That's insane. Yeah, 250,000. So I show up and I'm like, this is fucking heaven. I mean, Boston's a beautiful city. You just see U-Hauls with hot chicks and denim shorts loading fuck. And I got I got my father's army uh, duffel bag. That's mm. all I got. Stuff. That's that's it. 
and I, I go into my dorm room and, uh, and I, uh, I check in and I look at the door next to me, next to my dorm. And it says Chris Greenleaf. And I go, wow, that's fucking weird because I grew up, uh, we lived in Cherry Hill, New Jersey when I was like I remember five Cherry and Hill. six years that was old. A rough, rough Jersey. Was it? Back when we went there. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I think we lived in the nice part of the shitty town. Probably. And so uh, my next door neighbor and best friend for those two years was a kid named Chris Greenleaf and he had jet blonde hair. And so I fucking just knock on the door, door opens, kid with jet blonde hair down to here. He's a surfer. I go, Chris Greenleaf, he goes, yeah, I go, Greg Fitzsimmons. He goes, get the fuck out of here. What are the here. odds of that? So we start snorting crank that night. <laughs> we, we stayed up all night crank snorting crank. Real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and it was like the, <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> and we just bonded. The first we, night. <laughs> the first night. We stayed up all night. And he knew this other kid from the other oh, dorm, so we all hung shit. out. So anyway, the first week of school, so like the, that following weekend, we were out. And I come back to the dorms and it's like two o'clock in the morning and I'm drunk. And as I come up the stairs, I see this girl and she's being helped by two other girls and she's crying hysterically. And I'm like, what the fuck happened? And they said she just got sexually assaulted. Whoa. And I was like, fuck. And I got a sister and I was like, my blood got boiling. And I was with another guy named Jeff, Jeff Brown. And we go, what did he look like? Where is he? And they said, he's got on a, just just say like Mississippi prep school. He had something very specific on his sweatshirt. His blue sweatshirt, big guy. And I said, uh, all right, let's go. Let's go find him. So we, uh, so me and Jeff split up. BU is basically one avenue. It's one avenue in Boston. And so he goes left and I go right. And I, I go running up the street and I see a kid in a sweatshirt. It says Mississippi prep school on it. And I go, hey. I go, they want to talk to you back at the dorm. And he's like, what are you talking about? I go, you just molested somebody. And you're coming back to the dorm. So the guy pushes me. He's with another guy and they're fucking huge. It turns out later they're on the football team. So I'm on the ground. I pick up a very fine fruit punch bottle and I smash it and I chase after them and they run into the dorms. But the dorm that they're running into is like, it's got a, the, you have to be buzzed in by the security okay. guard. And the security guard is behind plexiglass. And so I enter as they enter and they're showing their IDs and I go, don't let them in. I go, this guy just attacked somebody at the dorm, call campus security, call the police. And the guy comes at me and I'm holding the fucking bottle and I'm drunk <laughs> and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fucking lunatic, but I, I got the bottle up and yeah. I got, I'm holding two football players with a very fine fruit punch bottle. They call the cops and it takes, it takes a while. <laughs> We're, they're like trying to go you shit with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> they're coming at me. I'm going like that. And so the cops show up. Holy the cops show up shit. and they look at me like, who is this lunatic? I go, this, this, this guy. So anyway, they, they get them. They get their statements. They get their ID, blah, blah, blah. Turns out the girl who it happened to, Carol, she decided she was a freshman, first week of school. She didn't want to press charges. She wanted to just go away. She wanted to enjoy her freshman year and not deal with it, which whatever. So then I get charges pressed against me for assault with a deadly weapon by the, the two guys. Fine juice because bottle. Of the, because of a very fine juice bottle. So I get a letter sent. You need to get them to sponsor your podcast, <laughs> dude. <laughs> very fine when you're in a pinch. <laughs> Two guys bigger than you? <laughs> Not when you got very fine. That is great. And so, so they're pressing charges? So they're pressing charges. My parents get a letter from the dean of the school and from the head of the dorm saying, I'm I'm losing my campus housing. I'm getting thrown out of campus housing. And uh, I might be thrown out of school. And they have a hearing. And so- And what are the charges? Like, what are you facing? Is it real jail time or is this just a, oh, a it's college a, thing? Oh, it's assault with a deadly weapon. It's real yeah, shit. Yeah, So what are your what are you facing? Like, how many well, years do you get for this shit? I don't know, but but I know that at the pre preliminary hearing, Carol showed up, and she sat there and she said, "If they don't, if they don't," and I talked to her about it. I said, "If she said if they don't drop the charges against him, I'm pressing charges for assault." And they dropped the charges, and uh, we were and good. And she let it all go. And I became good friends with her. That's nice. In college, yeah. Good for Carol. First week. Yeah. What a traumatic experience. And then for her to have to I go know. in there and be, and put herself on the fucking line I know, she did that for me. 
Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. And your friend, your friend Lee with her or became friends yeah, with her. Yeah. And then Jeff Brown, the other guy who uh, I'm still in touch with to this day. And I met, I had met him that night and we kind of bonded over it though. Do you crank with him too? <laughs> 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 You're like, come on, Carol. I got the answer to your problem. I guess I should have said the other kid's name. I'm talking about doing crank, but whatever. I mean, um, okay. I want to hear about this because we, you and I, share a common friend, Vicky. Um, and I met her at Oprah. And Vicky she, Ernst. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. she met you at Ellen. Yeah. Right. And I met her at Oprah. And right away, I know you. When you meet her, you just she's one of those you just click with right away. You're like, of course, of course, you like her. She lived with us. Oh, really? For, we have we have a little uh, studio apartment in our guest house in the back, and she lived there for like two years. She's the best. She's the greatest. I mean, I could sit and talk sports with her, like, but really talk sports. Yeah. With her. Like, just yeah. cover two D. These motherfuckers are running. I was like, uh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so you worked at Ellen, and you know we hear all these fucking stories about how horrible yeah. and everything what do you what what can you tell us because um, it's on your list so obviously it's a low light some of it i have to dance around certain things because i am under a non-disclosure agreement but i mean i think there's certain things that i can talk about because they're not defamatory to the show but which i would never be mm -mm. so i get i get hired at the show as a as a writer and and you know and you got to remember something like Ellen DeGeneres is one of the best comics to ever do it. Yep. And I was a huge fan of hers when she was just a road comic. And then I was half hour VH1's half hour comedy hour. I remember seeing her doing the smoking. Yeah. The, yeah. Killing. Killing it. Killing it. Killing it. And I was like, so I heard that she was, uh, I talked to Karen Kilgariff, who was, uh, yeah, the head, she was Karen. hired as the head writer for the show. One of my faves. And so Karen tells me about the job. Can I ask you, did you have to submit a packet or what did you have to submit for a show like Ellen? And was our, was Ellen already going when you did or was this a new thing coming? It, they had just developed it and okay. I was I was brought on for like three months before it started to help come up with what the show would be. And, uh, but no, I, I think... Uh, the the executive producer Mary Connolly I knew because she had booked me on Letterman she'd booked me on Kilborn she used to be a, a an executive producer on other late night talk shows so she so I knew her so I was in there and then Karen obviously we were good friends and she was the one who suggested I go for the job and so I think I did write so yeah I did I wrote some monologue jokes for her and she responded to them and so I got hired so I come in I'm a writer producer. And then we're doing test shows. So we'd bring in audiences, you know, before the air date to, to try out segments and try some monologues. With Ellen? With Ellen. Okay. We did test shows. And so at the time, we were they were looking for an audience warm-up person. And they couldn't find anybody that Ellen liked. You should look at stacks of tapes of guys that were the best warm-up. I don't like him. I don't like him. So then during the test shows, they Ellen said, hey, Greg, warm up the audience. So I went out. I just did my stand up and uh and I did some crowd work whatever. And so as we get closer to the start date, the executive producer comes to my office and and she goes uh Ellen's Ellen wants you to be the warm up guy. And I go, I'm not doing f fucking warm up on a daytime talk show. It's uh, plus writing and producing right. which is my main job. And she goes, "Well, here's what it pays." And it was like significant money. It a was extra on top of my salary, I was gonna get a whole other salary for literally walking out for five minutes. All you gotta do is five minutes, do oh, a little stand-up, bring her out, and you're you're done. Oh, you're not coming yeah. out the whole During entire During the commercials, time. they just played music and the audience would dance. Because everybody loved to dance yeah, there. Right. So it was the easiest job in the world for a ton of money. And so I was like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I go out there. And real quick, is this was five days a week? We taped five shows in five shows in four days. Five and four, okay. Fridays was a production day, and so the first week I go out there, and uh, and I'm it's easy. It's basically warmed down because her fans are so insane. Yeah, you got to go. Hey, everybody, keep your shit together, okay? She's just a person. <laughs> Relax. Yeah, it's like that. that instead huh? of what yeah. normally you're going like, come on, everybody, yeah, get yeah, up on yeah, your feet. Yeah. It's the easiest job in the world. And I would crush. I would do my I would do my like, you know, cleanest jokes. I would crush. And then I would uh and then I would sit in the front row and I had cue cards and I had a magic marker and I would I would on the fly I would write jokes for her and I'd hold them up and she'd do them. And so so it was fun. And uh but the first week, um I went out 
and I said to the crowd, and I'm trying to figure out what warm up is. What else? What else can you I do? You'd never done that. Before, I'd never right? done yeah, it. And I, and I go, I go. All right, you guys, let's do let's do the wave. You guys want to do the wave? I said, yeah. All right. I said, okay. Whenever I say banana, you guys do the wave. And so uh, I start talking. I go banana, and they do the wave. And I'm, and meanwhile, I'm friends with Eric Lederman and a bunch of guys that are standing on the side of the stage, doubled over, and what a corny hack I am. And so so anyway, so the show starts. Ellen comes out to do the monologue. I'm sitting in the front row and I'm sitting like not like 15 feet from her, right in front of her. And she comes out and she starts the monologue and then she goes, uh, so I made a smoothie and I put a banana in and I completely forgot that we had the word banana in the monologue. Yeah. Did they do it? The crowd stood up and did the wave. <laughs> this is the first week of the show. <laughs> Ellen is still nervous. <laughs> She does it, and all of a sudden, the way she goes, like, "Whoa!" She goes, "What just happened? What just happened?" I go, "You guys just did the wave. That's that's funny. That's weird. Why'd you do the wave?" Okay. Anyway, so I made a smoothie, and uh, so I peeled a banana. They do the wave nah. again, and she goes, "She goes, okay. I don't know what's going on, but if you guys could stop doing the wave," and I'm sitting there going, like. Holy fuck! I'm <laughs> Does fucked. the entire audience think this is a bit at this point? Yeah. No, yeah. they're in on it. They think Ellen's in on it. They think that this is all the plan. The warm up guys set up <laughs> Ellen so that she could do this. <laughs> and so it happens one more time, and then she just goes, "All right, stop, stop taping, stop the show. What's going?" And so I have to go up on stage and go, "Ellen, I, I kind of fucked up, and I told him to do the wave, and uh, she was not happy. She's not really? happy. Yeah." I would have laughed at that though. I'd have been like, "For real, you fucking did this." I think if it if, if it had happened maybe a month into the show, but it was like the first week, and uh, yeah, That's and just uh, chaos. So I got set. I got to my desk the next morning. I showed up for work, and there was a pile of bananas. My <laughs> friends had put on the desk. <laughs> No, but I can't speak about those days I, as much as I'd like to. I try to I try to not get sued. Yeah, how long were you there? I was there the first two years. Two years. Won four Emmys. Did you? Congrats, dude. Two for producing and two for writing. Hell yeah. 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 How's that helped you in your career? Has it helped? I think a daytime Emmy, I think four of them equals half of a nighttime Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> four, that's a lot. God damn a lot. Nobody gives a shit. That's Nobody no cares. Thing. Nobody cares. No. That's cool. You got a trophy? Yeah. Cool. yeah. And they look good. I gave yeah, my mom yeah, one and she yeah, loves yeah. it. Yeah. And then the other ones are like tucked away in my office. You, well, I got the, I got the right? YouTube, yeah, yeah, I got the YouTube plaque on our wall over here. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> Nobody cares about these <laughs> What's things. the YouTube plaque? When you hit 100,000 subscribers, they send you a plaque. No. Yeah. And then the next one's at a million, they send you another plaque. Oh no shit. Or maybe there's a half a million. I'm not wow. sure. But yeah, they send you a plaque that you pay for. Yeah. You know, nothing's free, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the right. money, all the money they made off you, and they're like, you got to pay for that plaque. Right, right. Yeah, those that hardware is nice though when you get older. Yeah, that's know, what I'm saying. On the mantle. Yeah. Um, what's some of your go back to uh, some of the jobs you had before comedy? Some of the worst shit you ever did. I did it. We had a uh, me and my brother started a business. We lived in Newport, Rhode Island. You ever been to Newport? I've been to, no, I've been to Rhode Island. Yeah, Newport's Newport. a fancy ass town. It's okay. all the biggest mansions. They were all built during the Gilded Age, you know, like the the Astors and they had all, all these like literally they look like museums. They're okay. gigantic and they're on the most breathtaking stretch of of rocky coast and it's amazing. And so we go out there, me and my brother are going out there and we're living in a house with 11 other people. It's a converted horse barn. Are you family or is this all friends? Or It's just me and my brother and then my buddy Chris and then a couple of friends from college and then a okay. couple of their friends. And God. So, so we're staying in this house and me and my brother decide because we, we had met a guy. We lived in the Hamptons the summer before and we were bussing tables and shit. Never been there either. I really want to go there. Yeah, Hamptons is nice. And so we go out and uh, and we, we knew this guy and he was running his own business. And so he we learned from him. We just basically talked to him a lot. We go, we're going to do that next summer. And so the business model is you go to all the real estate places and you say, we are going to do any odd job anybody needs done. Landscaping, babysitting, house cleaning, ride to the airport, 
fucking mm. driveway ceiling, whatever you need done, pool cleaning, we do it. We don't do any of it. But we tell them, me and my brother show up, we put on suit and tie, and we walk into every real estate place in Newport. We get these nice color brochures we made up, and we hand them out, and everybody's very impressed. And, and it's also one of those places where it's so expensive to live there that it's actually hard to find people to do menial jobs. Yeah, and I know that people with money love to pay for shit that's convenient for right, them. Right, right. And save them. Their time is valuable. Exactly. Yeah. So we start, our start, phone starts ringing off the hook and we're getting jobs and we've, we've got everybody in the house. That's a great idea. They're all working for us. And the idea is we're charging 20 bucks an hour and we're going to pay our friends 15 bucks an hour and we're going to keep the five and just answer phones all day. And so we start sending them out. And of course, they're all fucking hung over. People are showing up late. People don't want to die. I'm not mowing a lawn. What I, I mow a lawn. Yeah, you said you fucking, I'm not mowing 15. Why are you getting 20 and I'm getting 15? <laughs> yeah. Well, because we were the ones that said, nah, that's not fair. I should get 20. Well, what, then what? how are you getting, it's like all of that all day. And it turns into me and my brother doing the jobs. It turns into just us. You did do it? We did all the shit. And we didn't have no idea what we were doing. This one guy, Mr. Schindelman, he owned a condo complex. And it was like a bunch of little bungalows around a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And he charged premium money because there was a pool. So he hired my brother to open up the pool. And when you, I don't know if you know about pool maintenance, but you got to yeah, shock you a shock pool. It. Yeah, you the shock lifeguard. It. Yeah, the pH, everything's yeah. got to be balanced. Yeah, and and they, and we show up, and there's algae on the on the pool, and the and the, the 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 pump doesn't work, and everything's fucked up. So my brother says, "I can take care of it," and we're charging him. And my brother like can't figure it out the first week, can't figure it out the second week. Memorial Day comes and goes. Tenants are complaining. By July, the pool July. still has algae on it. There's a rent strike. <laughs> nah. -uh. Sh Schindelman, su <laughs> Schindelman sues strike. us. Nah. He sues us because he's been paying God, us. Seriously. So now we got a lawsuit. We're dodging this guy. I do a driveway sealing job, which I don't know if you've sealed a driveway, mm -hmm. but you get this like tar and you and you pour. So we went to this hardware store and we bought some some of the tar. And uh and I I didn't read the directions. I just I just got a broom and I fucking swept it, made it black. I leave, I get paid. Two days later, it rains. And I was supposed to, something I didn't do right. The rain washed all the, the tar into this like $10,000 Japanese garden, killed all the flowers. No, it did yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Destroyed, the, the driveway looked like shit. She's suing us. And then- <laughs> Meanwhile, Multiple like, lawsuits. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, like, there's this one girl. We got this other woman, and we're cleaning her house, and she's a she's a divorcee, and she's newly divorced, and she's got this apartment, and she wants us to clean it. And so, me and my brother don't want to clean it, so we say, all right, we'll we'll switch every other week. Each guy will clean the apartment, and I would show up, and I'd be like, man, this woman's a fucking pig. This place looks like it hasn't been clean in two weeks, and so. I start getting all like, what the fuck is going on? And then I find out my brother's showing up and he's banging her and he's not cleaning. Nah. -uh. He's just having sex with her. He's getting paid. He's, he's getting paid to have sex with her. He's cleaning her pipes, yeah, yeah. bro. <laughs> and I'm doing two weeks worth yeah, of cleaning. you are. <laughs> and I'm flirting with her. I had no idea. So I'm kind of flirting with her, but he, I did, he, he had Did game. she know I, you were brothers? Oh, yeah. Oh, she did. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. But he had game. I didn't have the game. That is hilarious. And then so so we had a 76 Valare station wagon, Plymouth Valare. Yeah. And the uh, it didn't, somehow it didn't, reverse didn't work. And so whenever we parked the car, we would have to open up the doors, me, him, and my friend, and, and we would just kick, we would kick it backwards nah. to get out of parking spots. Yeah. And so we left. <laughs> You're Flintstone on it we, to get yeah, we the <laughs> Ah, Fitzsimmons, awesome. meet the Fitzsimmons. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, Y'all yeah. using your feet to yeah. get out. And the company was That's called Sure Thing Home Services. <laughs> You're pushing, -O -O -E. out, pushing out of a parking space, <laughs> yeah. a sure thing over here. <laughs> Picking up girls. All right, ladies, open your door. You got to earn this one. Get your high heels on. <laughs> oh, shit. So we left That's town and like, uh, by at the end of the summer, we packed our shit and we left in the middle of the night. And no lawsuits ever hit you? 
None nah, of that shit's ever followed. Nah, we went you. back to college. We forgot about it. Dude, that is fucking ten thousand dollar <laughs> Japanese guard. Like it had to be the worst shit. <laughs> toxic. Whatever I used was toxic. <laughs> Oh, uh, man. What was your very first job ever? I used to caddy when I was like, I was probably like 12. And, and I would, uh, I, I weighed like less than 100 pounds. And I go out there, they give me one bag. But this is this is in the 80s when it, people had those Rodney Dangerfield bags. Yeah, with those the, big he's got the Dodge radio Ram on van, it. The radio, yeah, yeah, got a yeah, beer tap. Yeah. But these guys would fucking, they'd have an umbrella. They would have like, 30 extra balls. They had like, wait, you're supposed to have 14 clubs. These guys have like 17 clubs in there, a rain jacket, an extra pair of shoes. And I, and, and the golf course that I worked at, it was like the hilliest fucking, it was, and if you, if you, I looked it up online, the average golf course, if you walk it is about seven miles. So I'd be it's out there. You say golf. Golf. Yeah. Say like Baltimore, right? I say golf. Oh, you say golf. Yeah. Like the Gulf of Mexico. Do you say golf of Mexico? Gulf of Mexico. So you say, say it again? Well, Gulf of Mexico is spelled, spelled G-U-L. Yeah. I say it the same way as what I'm saying. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Golf and golf. <laughs> Gulf of Mexico, <laughs> I'm going to go golf. <laughs> I don't change it. <laughs> so, ahead, sorry. So, and I worked my way up to two bags and I used to get, I, I can't believe this shit. I used to get up at like. Six six thirty in the morning, I'd get on my ten speed bike, and it was about a seven mile ride to Damn, the golf course. One way, one way was seven miles. I'd get there, I would carry a bag, and then eventually two bags for seven fucking miles. Some days I would do two loops, and then I get back on that bike and I'd ride it back home again. All right, and so then I do go this math in my head. If you did two loops, that would be fourteen miles. Fourteen right? miles with plus bags. a seven ride and seven bags, so twenty eight miles. Yep. Holy shit! Yeah. yeah. God and hilly. Damn, yeah, and hilly. yeah, yeah. And you're biking and walking. Yeah. Fuck, And then dude. I go drinking all night. <laughs> well, you're probably in the best shape of your life. Isn't it amazing when you were young, the energy that you had? Yeah. I, I could go out, I could sleep, you know, five hours and go do it again. I don't want to do that with a cart. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I didn't want to drive with it. Yeah. And we would go, and on the I'd ride my bike and I'd stop at Twin Donuts on the way and I'd get a ham and egg sandwich on a roll and all the caddies would sit in the yard and they'd bust each other. He was all these kids from Yonkers. He's like tough Irish Catholic kids from Yonkers. And they were the funniest motherfuckers I've ever met. And it was this, this one kid, his name was Bob Kalaki. And they called him Killer Kalaki because he, he had his head shaved and he was trying to get in the Marines. But he kept getting rejected because he was too intense. He was too intense for the Marines. I've never heard of that in my life. Yeah, yeah. This guy would be like, climbing fucking trees while he was out there and they there was i think he had a record i think he had some kind of a record and uh and there was another guy named one arm willie who was a one arm caddy who was a like, one arm caddy yeah and he was he, he looked like he was in his 80s he was old they'd send him out with one bag one arm but they but the members loved him because he could read putts and he knew the course um pga jack there was a rumor that he he lived in his car and there was rumors that he'd killed people. <laughs> and he lived in the fucking parking lot of the country That's club. He slept in his slept in his car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Smelled like shit. I'll bet. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. And and then the, the caddy master, Bobby, Bobby Orman, he would do this thing when the fall came and you were caddying in the fall. He had uh, the betting slips for the NFL, and so if you if you bought a ticket, then you got a good loop. If you bu if you bought five tickets, you got a really good loop. Mm -hmm. If you didn't buy any tickets, you didn't get out that yeah. day at all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. he wouldn't even send you out. No. <laughs> now so there was always more yeah, caddies than there yeah. were loops. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of ass kissing that went on. There was a lot of politics that went on. This is great, dude. I, I look, we were there already. I can't believe we're there already. We got to get you out of here. Uh, I got to get out of here. But thank you for doing this. This is a pleasure, man. Anytime, brother. And it's um, good seeing you around the store now. I'm so congratulations on passing you, in. Man. Thank you. I doing some spots. It. Everybody's been super uh, um, kind about it. I'm very. I was pleasantly surprised by that. 
Well, it's mostly not, people just don't even give a shit. But so many, it's a, it's a different camaraderie there. No, it's a club. Like, yeah. I mean, it's a club, and you're in it, and you should have been in it a long time ago. But it, but the 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 truth is like. When guys like you are working the club, it's better for everybody, you know, That's because nice the lineups are stronger you. and the crowds get hotter and, you know, it's great. Yeah, it's been coming back. It feels good in there lately. Yeah. Um, plug everything again, please. All right. I'm going to be on the road. Go to fitzdog.com to get tickets. I'm going to be coming to, uh, uh, where am I? La Jolla and Spokane and New Orleans, Lafayette. Denver Comedy Works, my second favorite club in the country. What's your first? I never say. All right, tell me later. I never say because that, if I say Tacoma, if I say, then people, the other club owners, are like, hey, what the fuck? Right. Yeah. But this is my second favorite podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it, brother. I'll take it. <laughs> uh, as always, RyanSickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. We'll talk to you all next week. 